Uh, welcome everybody to our series of all in coronary physiology that's uh, sponsored by Absence. Um, these series are focused on coronary physiology, implementing current data and uh, current techniques in interventional cardiology. In this series, uh, or the title of current uh, episode is Coronary Physiology in the Modern Era of PCI. We have a very uh, experienced and um, um, ex expert in the field in physiology, starting with Dr. Morton Kern, Stephen Fort, Oliver uh, Bertrand, and uh, we will have a one hour and a few minutes after the hour just to go over basics, advanced, and then case examples. Uh, starting with the uh, first speaker, uh, Dr. Morton Kern. Um, Dr. Morton Kern has returned to the position as a Chief of Cardiology at Veteran Administration Long Beach Healthcare System, and he's also a staff of interventional cardiologist there. He's a professor of medicine at University of California, Irvine, in the Division of Cardiology. In addition to being the clinical editor of the Cath Lab Digest, he is the author of the Kern's Car uh, Cardiac Cath Handbook, 7th edition, and uh, its companion, the Interventional Cardiac Cath Handbook, 4th edition. I think everybody uh, who touched a cat in the lab knows Dr. Kern and his book and his experience and how much he uh, kind of gave us principles and advanced uh, techniques in the lab. Uh, Dr. Kern is going to talk to us today about the coronary physiology from Andreas uh, Krodzik to 2020. Dr. Kern, welcome to the again to the webinar series and uh, the, uh, the platform is yours. Thank you, Chadi. A, a pleasure to join you again. Um, I, this is a, a really great opportunity to review something that hardly anyone recalls, but it has very important uh, pertinence to what we're doing today. So I'm gonna show you the, uh, a little bit of the history of coronary physiology that I had uh, learned from Dr. Grunzig and others. Now. Let me just share my screen. Uh, here we go. And this, uh, just in case anybody had seen this before, this is a condensed version of a lecture keynote speech I had given a couple of years ago to the Society of Cardiac Angiography and Intervention. Uh, on the anniversary, the 30th anniversary of the society. And this was uh, a little history. So let me just dive right in. In 15 minutes, I'm going to talk to you about the coronary physiology. Here are my disclosures. And uh, just to start things off, Dr. Grunzig was a rather unique individual. He was a radiologist, uh, a German, moved to Switzerland, became interested in peripheral vascular disease, then coronary disease, in terms of opening arteries. He was the very first individual who applied translational coronary physiology uh, in the work of opening arteries. And here he is drawing a picture of a stenosis. He was a very uh, academically oriented individual. Here's a graphic from his first publication, not his first, but the first publication on coronary angioplasty called non-operative dilation of coronary artery stenosis. And of note, it is important to see that he believed that the pressure gradient across the stenosis was a marker of success. Little did he know that this is among the most important aspects of coronary intervention. He, he uh, started measuring gradients through a very large catheter for French. If you can see this tracing on the bottom, you can see when a balloon is inflated, the pressure goes down. He wasn't aware that this represented collateral pressure and it comes back up on release and the return of the gradient to match aortic pressure and show that the pressure across an artery was now normalized was the mark of success because angiography was so poor. Now he used a guide catheter that was nine French, a balloon that was 4.5 French, and on the end of the balloon was a second lumen fluid filled that we measured pressure through. Most people thought this was a too coarse a measurement to be useful, and so pressure really didn't rise for several years. Here's Grunzig, uh, Zeitler, who invented uh, the monorail catheter, and Charles Dotter, who put Grunzig on the path to use a balloon to dilate arteries. And of course, I'm just paraphrasing. I wasn't at this meeting, but if I was, Grunzig would have said, physiology beats angioplasty, speaking to daughter. And daughter said, well, what's pressure? Because none of his catheters had pressure measurements. He just had dilators. Now, a few years before Grunzig and a few years after Grunzig, 
Uh, Dr. Lance Gould was working to understand the limitations of flow through arteries and, and created this model uh, that coronary flow reserve, the increase of basal flow of basal flow to a maximal value of hyperemia called coronary flow reserve occurs and is diminished along a, a curve line as a percent diameter stenosis gets bigger. So dog arteries were instrumented with calipers to put on measurable clamp diameter stenoses and coronary flow reserve was measured with contrast from base to hyperemic contrast. And he said that at, at around 50 or 60%, you start to reduce coronary flow reserve. And therefore, if we lo look at the reverse, if you have a coronary stenosis of 50%, your coronary flow reserve must be challenged. And therefore, that value is a significant number. This was never true in human beings because the coronary a flow reserve when measured in arteries with angiographic percent diameter stenosis in the operating room had no correlation to the uh, diameter stenosis by an angiogram that was taken before. This should be an obvious uh, event because one, people have abnormal coronary flow reserves unlike the doggies, and two, that the angiogram is not a clamp. And so we have a very difficult time to make any correlation of it. Now, Lance Gould is shown here with Nils Johnson and Rick Kirkity on the left, I'm in the, in the middle there. And uh, it's through their work, their initial work that we started to understand human coronary physiology, ultimately leading to the development of fractional flow reserve and to resting uh, pressure ratios. I was fortunate that years ago in 1991, I uh, received a, a Doppler guide wire to be able to measure for the first time in, in people uh, coronary Basic Doppler signals. On the, on the uh, center here, you can see my lab, a picture of it. We had an angioscope, an IVUS machine, a Doppler machine, our crude angiograms, which are very challenging to make sense out of uh, coronary stenosis, very imprecise. On the right was a Doppler catheter, uh, sorry, a Judkins catheter we equipped with a Doppler uh, transducer, a tracking catheter to measure pressure that was one French in diameter, and this 18 uh, inch Doppler guide wire. And with these tools, <coughs> we started to uncover uh, aspects of coronary physiology that heretofore had only been observed in dogs. And so in people, we started to look at human coronary flow velocity, giving adenosine here, watching the average peak velocity increase over 30 seconds, watching it decline back to baseline and calculate a flow velocity reserve. We had beautiful signals at that time, uh, spectral Doppler. There was a small systolic, large diastolic component, which increased with hyperemia. This was really, I think, a breakthrough that ultimately led to the pressure flow uh, information we use today. In 1993, we put together all the people in the world that were writing about Doppler coronary physiology and translational flow into a into a uh, symposium and it was quite exhilarating. Now, in the early days of angioplasty, it was thought that a good result from a balloon angioplasty, here's before balloon angioplasty, here's after balloon angioplasty, and the result was pretty good, pretty respectable. And then after a stent went in, the angiogram improved somewhat, uh, but it wasn't clear that for a while, why should an angio, uh, a balloon angioplasty have such a high restenosis rate? Well, we started to measure pressure and flow, mostly flow at this time, subsequently pressure. But we found out that if you measure flow reserve, it didn't increase from baseline very much after a balloon at all. Uh, and then after you put a stent in, it, it increased more. If you look over here on the upper right, the circles were pre, the squares were post, and the triangles were post stent. But many patients did not increase their flow reserve. That's that area below two. So there was something else going on. 80% of the time we had success, better with stenting than certainly balloon. We did the IVUS and learned that this was due to material left inside the artery that the vessel couldn't detect. But without measuring pressure and flow, we had really no way to understand what we were truly doing. We did identify the fact that microvascular disease was still present in patients who have stents. And so flow reserve was uh, identified as problematic in some. One day in my cath lab, we had this Doppler wire down a balloon 
angioplasty that we're performing and, and the signals went from positive after balloon dilatation to zero when we inflated the balloon. And then we discovered if we waited another 30 seconds, we could see a reversed flow signal coming back toward the tip of the catheter, meaning flow was coming in another direction. This was rep repeatable and reliable. And this was our first observation that coronary collateral flow could be detected both by flow now and subsequently by pressure measurements during coronary balloon occlusion. In 1993, uh, Nico Pills and Bernard de Brun started to publish their work using a high fidelity pressure guide wire. And Ratty Company in 1994 released their first version of this. And then we really took off in making measurements to understand lesions that were flow limiting, lesions that created gradients, and lesions that needed our treatment, and lesions that didn't. Uh, Bernard and colleagues identified uh, advances in the calculations of flow reserve made from pressure. So they had a pressure derived system of calculating the fraction of normal flow reserve and they called it FFR. And this is done by, by with the help of Gould and Kirkity. Johnson did a nice review on the subject and validated the fact that the ratio of flows could be calculated from the ratio of pressures. This was the foundational uh, studies that brought us there. Uh, I remember in 1994, we convened the first uh, European meeting of coronary physiology to show the value of Doppler flow and the value of FFR. Here were some of the participants. You can recognize the young Patrick Soroys, uh, John Peake from Amsterdam, Nico Piles and Schaefer, an expert in collaterals. And we showed at this meeting uh, that we had a normal flow across a 60% lesion in a right coronary artery. We also measured flow reserve at that time, and it was very normal, greater than 2.6. And we said to Patrick Soroys, now that we showed you that this 60% lesion has normal flow and normal pressure, what would you like to do? And of course, Patrick said, stent it, of course. It looked bad. So I realized at that time that uh, we had a very uphill battle to convince uh, interventionalists to give up the angiogram and accept physiology. That never changed even to this day. It's still a challenge. Subsequently, the European uh, Society uh, convened a meeting of coronary physiology in 1996 at the Hart House. It had all these different people there. I think I'm on that side, but I'm not sure. I'm one of those guys over there. And Nico and I had a debate, which is better, pressure or flow? And uh, Nico put together a very uh, exciting presentation, but it was highly populated with mathematical formulas. And I knew that Nico had the right answer because you could assess a lesion easily, clearly, and with high detection of ischemia. Uh, and I knew that Doppler didn't work all the time because of coronary microvascular disease. And I said, but I said to Nico, nobody's going to buy this work unless we get rid of all that mathematics. People just can't get it. Those formulas are killing me. And Nico said, what are you talking about? I said, Nico, there's too much math. If we just simplify, give adenosine, use a pressure wire, record the tracing, you can calculate the number. The math can come later. And sure enough, we could really sell this. And I think it worked in that way. Well, the field moved on. Everybody's familiar with these critical landmark studies, the foundational studies of DEFER, FAME, FAME 1 and 2. And with data, usage and acceptance of a concept became part of our daily practice. Now, I had a wonderful experience uh, participating both during some of the studies, but often as a reviewer or as a, uh, a safety monitor for this. And over these years from when we started, uh, there were events of, of particular note to me. Now I put five stars there, I put a few more stars up here and Bill Fearon, who was at Stanford as a fellow in the early, in the late 90s, I tried to bring him to St. Louis on numerous occasions, but he just wouldn't leave St. Louis. He has been one of the main stars of our physiology world. And my congratulations continue because he continues to produce uh, such great work. Well, we thought we were really doing well. And then all of a sudden, uh, the concept of IFR is introduced. And the question I had put to uh, my colleagues at this FAME commemoration dinner were, guys, can a PDPA or IFR really work to replace FFR? And they just kept saying, I don't think so. No, nope, I don't 
think that's going to happen. I didn't think it was going to happen either. The foundation was a little weak, but nonetheless, five years later, the, the IFR studies from uh, Justin Davies and Matthias Gutenberg were presented at the ACC, and they, of course, found that these were uh, non-inferior with a threshold of 89 for IFR and 80 for FFR, that these studies now entered our lives and changed the way the, the interventional community thought about uh, FFR. Uh, Marty Leon and I were sitting at the podium. Marty asked me, does that mean that IFR equals FFR? And I, I had to say, no, 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 Marty, that's non-inferior. But you know, I, I made a mistake once, I thought, but uh, I was wrong. What this really meant was that the field now is wide open. That is, every interventionalist should be paying attention and applying physiology as needed. And they can even do it without hyperemia. The industry heard what had been presented over these many years and developed new technology. OpSense, of course, has uh, is the latest entrance in the last few years. They're bringing a superior wire, better signal quality, everything that we needed in a, a angioplasty wire to conduct a, a one wire study, pre, during, and post physiology at our fingertips. And lastly, just recently, Kagami and his colleagues did a, a current review of the physiology uh, in the world around us and things that are available. In the cath lab, of course, we have this plethora of good measurements. We have the hyperemic measurements of FFR and CFR. We have the non-hyperemic drive pressure ratios, whole cycle and diastolic subcycle. And in the future, uh, we're likely to see angiographically derived FFR. And before patients come to our cath lab, they will see CT derived FFR as well. So here's an example of the CT FFR. You've seen that. Here are several different uh, versions of the virtual angio derived FFR software. We're in a great uh, period of time where this information is going to change the way we make decisions and get the benefit to our patients. So I'm going to say thank you very much. I'm going to return the screen to Chadi. I'm going to stand by for questions. And I uh, hope I didn't spend too much time uh, with that. but stimulate your thinking into our things that we do. Beautiful work, Dr. Kern, as always. I mean, you are on time, uh, perfect presentation. And always, this is my third time maybe watching part of this history talk for you. And it's always, I learn something new from this history and how much work it takes to, to bring us to, uh, to what we are. Make, sounds easy in the lab, so, but just need people just to believe in it more and do it more. Uh, Thank you. We're going to have some uh, questions for the audience. Please, if you have any questions, use the Q&A box. Uh, we're going to entertain these questions between talks. And also, you're going to have uh, polls coming uh, between uh, talks for you to uh, respond to. So uh, with that, I'm going to launch the first poll for you. While we're introducing the second speaker is uh, Sorry for that, Dr. Uh, Stephen Fort. Uh, we're going to speak. Up, he's going to speak about coronary physiology, the best practices. So now we saw Dr. Kern talking about the history, how we are, and what is the pathway that took to reach where we are now, and how we're going to do implement best practice with physiology. So Dr. Fort is a graduate from the University of Leeds in UK, 1984. He completed his training at University of Wales Hospital, Royal London Hospital, and Royal Infirmary of at Edinburgh. He was a British Heart Foundation Research Fellow at the University College of Wales, uh, studying myocardial contractility and endo, uh, endothelial function, receiving his MD in 1994. He is currently staff cardiologist, specializing in PCI intervention and cardiac and coronary imaging and physiology at uh, Kelowna General Hospital. Dr. Ford, thank you so much for being with us here today. Um, and uh, you, the platform is yours if you want to share your slides. Thank you, Chaddy. Um, well, good evening, uh, everyone. Um, I'll just get my slides uh, ready. Um, thank you for the uh, for options uh, organizing uh, this, uh, and thank you for the uh, invitation to be involved. Um, it's quite difficult following Dr. Kern, but I shall do my best. Um, 
I'm not an academic. Um, I'm a, a jobbing interventional cardiologist. Uh, I have no conflicts of interest to declare with regards to this presentation, but I'm just going to put you on these slides, my viewpoint in taking what technologies we currently have, making sure that we have the best practices to obtain the best results. So I've got a number of objectives. We'll, we'll go through what I personally believe is perhaps the best uh, index and pressure wire device to use for the lesion. I'm going to concentrate on pressure wire preparation because there's a few pitfalls to avoid. And then a few slides about disconcordance between the various indices that we can use. I'm going to leave stenting and post stenting for Olivia and Bertrand to talk to a little bit later. Now, as uh, Dr. Kern has shown you, we have a number of devices to use for coronary physiology. We have four uh, pressure wires and we have a micro catheter. Now the micro catheter has two distinct advantages. Firstly, you can use your own uh, guide wire and also you can then perform pull bite with the micro catheter without fear of losing your distal wire position. Now, in terms of the pressure wires, they fall into two distinct groups as uh, Dr. Kern illustrated. We have the piezoelectric uh, hollow uh, wires of eccentric design and then the fiber optic design. Now, in terms of performance, the fiber optic catheter wires have three distinct advantages over the piezoelectric wires. With the larger, more state-of-the-art core nitinol wire rather than the stainless steel core wire, they offer greater flexibility, less kinking, much better performance and torqueability. Reconnectivity is not impossible with the piezoelectric wires, but you do need to remove the blood and the solute. Uh, it's much easier with a fiber optic wire. And with the uh, pressure, uh, the fiber optic wire, it's much, you get much less drift, uh, a higher, um, more stable uh, sensor on the wire. As Dr. Kern's already illustrated, we, you know, we have five different devices and we have a plethora of different pressure ratios. Which one do we use? Well, we've been using the hyperemic FFR for many years with a cutoff of less than 0 0.80. And then they have these new the, the non-hyperemic pressure ratios, which are divided into two. There's the whole cycle and there's the subcycle. Now, in terms of the whole cycle, we all know about uh, deep, uh, PDPA. Uh, it's available in all systems. It's not proprietary. The cutoff is less than 0 0.91. There's another whole cycle measurement, RFR. I'll come back to that in a second. Then we have the diastolic, the subcycle indices, DFR, IFR, and DPR. And all these share the same cutoff of less than 0 0.89. If we go back for a moment to the RFR, technically it's a whole cycle measurement, but as I'll illustrate here, while the entire cardiac cycle is scanned, effectively, it only tells you the lowest subcycle pressure gradient, which obviously it will be a diastolic measurement. And hence, our uh, PFR shares, same, uh, shares the same cutoff as the diastolic indices of less than 0 0.89. Now we have lots of data over the years with Justin and his colleagues comparing IFR and FFR, but we don't have as much data. But this slide shows you that in effect, however you look at it, IFR and DPR, it's a class effect. And that resulted in approval of such wires uh, to the market for clinical use in the absence of such data that was associated with IFR. In fact, if you look at all the other non-hyperemic pressure ratios, uh, compared to uh, uh, FFR, they have a similar AUC as IFR of greater than 0 0.99. In fact, on this slide, it also shows you the resting gradient, PDPA, and it's good, almost as good as the diastolic uh, indices with an AUC of 0 0.97. I'll come back to the relevance of what I believe is the importance of 
uh, PDPA later. Now, in terms of which index do you use? Uh, there are lots of them. Um, from a personal perspective, I made a decision about four or five years ago to stop using adenosine. In fact, I've only used it once in the last few years. And the only reason I used it then was that the lab underwent maintenance and the technicians forgot to connect the ECG input to the FFR system uh, because IFR at that time, but no longer, but at that time needed an ECG input. So I stopped using adenosine in practice. And why did I do so? So I'm gonna paraphrase a um, former professor of biochemistry for MIT. And it is possible to know too much. So a man with one watch knows what time it is. A man with two watches is never sure. So that's why I stopped using adenosine and switched to the hyperemic index. And it has a number of distinct advantages over FFR and adenosine use. You don't use adenosine, so it's obviously quick and easy. You can assess osteo lesions using the resting non hyperemic index. You don't have to worry about whether the drug was given intracoronary. You don't have to worry about whether the catheter is producing pressure damping or not. You can easily perform pullback. You don't need an intravenous infusion. In fact, with the new sync vision of Philips, you can co-register the IFR with the angiographic images. And we now have excellent data as shown by Dr. Kern that IFR is non-inferior to FFR. And because of the uh, bench studies, uh, now DPR is considered to be the same as IFR. So we have a variety of wires and systems now, and we can measure non hyperemic indexes of the variety of systems. Now, there are a number of disadvantages uh, using a non hyperemic index at setup is important in all systems. It's probably even more important when you're looking at just diastolic gradients. And of course, if you're using adenosine, you're measuring FFR, there's going to be disconcordance in a small number of cases. Now, uh, FFR, this slide's been shown to you by Dr. Kern. It's a whole cycle a mean gradient. And whereas the resting gradients there's an intrinsic hyperemia during the coronary cycle, probably predominantly in diastole, and you use that rather than giving a hyperemic drug to specifically focus on the diastolic ratios and not the whole cycles. So using this small sample size raises a question of potential errors when you're measuring it. And also small measures may have a greater, more significant impact because using IFR or DPR, you only have a 11 point normal window from 0 0.9, 0 0.9 to 1.0 compared to a 19 point normal window of 0 0.81 to one with adenosine induced FFR. So I think it's important with all pressure wire systems to use it properly to set it up, but with the diastolic gradient, probably even more important to make sure before you normalize or equalize your wire that you flush the contrast out of the catheter to allow these high fidelity devices uh, to work properly. If you cross a lesion, then it's always good to flush before measurement, particularly if you've given contrast on advancing the wire. And if you have pull, you have to perform a pullback to exclude drift, particularly with the piezoelectric wires, because drift is quite common. Unfortunately, if you get drift, uh, then you have to start again. Now to these important setups and usages of wires for the non hyperemic or the diastolic indices, I'd also add in my practice that I routinely measure PDPA before doing a spot uh, IFR or DPR measurement. Now, if we're still using adenosine, we're going to be still using or measuring multiple indices, we're going to get some disagreement and we're going to get discordance between FFR and IFR. And it's actually greater than one in eight cases. So it's relatively common. However, it only tends to occur 
on those borderline lesions. And I think it's important to know that in borderline lesions, the, the amount of flow that's improved post-PCI is also borderline. So there's a lot of uh, attention is being paid to these discordant results. But I'm not quite sure clinically whether it's as relevant because ischemia is a great is a spectrum from high to low. So how would I use uh, pressure wire in my real world practice? I mean, we do have too many indices. The more you use, the more likely you get disagreement. But it's important to note we're not in a binary world. We're not uh, entering patients in randomized controlled trials. We don't have to randomize between one of two limbs as we do in randomized controlled trials. And I think it's important to note, particularly in areas around the borderline cutoff, uh, particularly in areas where you may get disconcordant results if you use multiple indices, I think the clinical and the angiographic features are still uh, important in patients. And I give, raise one example is that the LAD and the non-LAD vessels may be actually different. Currently, all indices have the same cutoff, irrespective of the coronary vessel. But I think clinical angiographic features are still important, particularly in those borderline areas, particularly since uh, borderline areas, borderline lesions, the benefits of post-PCI aren't that significantly different. And in my clinical practice, if I need a second option, then I tend to use PDPA rather than introducing adenosine and measuring it as a hybrid approach. But the bottom line is we are spoiled. Uh, we've come a long way in terms of physiology. We have great equipment. The science is complex. But I think if we use it in the right way, we're sensible, the setup's good, we're focused, and introducing a few, I think, areas of adjustment in terms of clinical angiographic features, we can use these pressure wires to great advantage. So we have excellent pressure wire devices, the great performance, particularly from the fiber optic wire for three particular indices, uh, trackability, reconnectivity, and drift. I think we use these and other pressure wire devices, we'll get great results. And with that, I'll hand it back to you, Chaddy, to see if there's any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Ford. Uh, great talk. Um, we have a couple of questions, but I also have a question to you as well. And if when you have, you talked about discordance. And uh, so, I'll, first of all, I'll start with a question. You have a patient have a positive stress test. He has unstable angina. At, or stable angina, you stress him in the lab and in the office, lateral wall, you see a CERC lesion, moderate, 60%. Do you routinely do physiology on these territory as well? Or you believe the stress test and you go ahead and do PCI? Uh, good question, Chaddy. I have to say that I don't try and overcomplicate cases. If I'm confident that clinically the patient has angina and there is a number of uh, non-invasive tests, which I trust, and they're clearly positive. Despite the angiogram showing a borderline lesion, I would not perf perform further interrogation. I would believe what's been performed before. I wouldn't like to argue uh, in an invasive way a patient who has good symptoms of angina and a strongly positive stress test in the appropriate ter territory. I, I wouldn't try and argue against those features by introducing higher technologies. So I tend to use them in a focused way. I tend to use them in patients where I'm not sure whether they have clinical angina or not. Non-invasive tests may be borderline. The angiogram is borderline, but I don't tend to use them in cases where I think I've already got good evidence and I don't need to reinvent the wheel. I'd be, I'd be interested to hear what Olivier and Morton here think about that particular area. So just a, a word, you have just described the, the individual you just described falls into the class three, uh, don't use it, recommendation for physiology. You don't need to use it there. You shouldn't probably use it there because you introduce air and then you have two watches and now, now you're in trouble because you don't know what time it is. So I, excellent talk. I just want to remind people that if you're flushing either with saline or contrast, you need to wait until the hyperemic effect of those two flushes 
is gone before you accept the PDPA or the IFR or the DPR because you must return to a basal flow state. If you have hyperemia, you're going to have a lower number than you would without hyperemia. So good. That's just my single cautionary note on that. Now, another question also to Dr. Kern and the panel. If you have a borderline DPR or IFR and the radio borderline, you repeated the measurement again and again, it's 0.9 and you believe the patient is symptomatic. Do you have like a next, what's the next step would be? Well, I'll, I'll let uh, Dr. Ford answer that one, then I'll, I'll follow. Okay. <clears throat> um, I think I would take a step back. Um, you've told me that clinically this patient has angina and intracoronary physiology has been borderline. I then I take it back to the angiographic features. If it's a type A lesion, I don't think there's a great loss in, in stenting that lesion. If it's a complex calcified lesion, might need debulking, rebotabating. It's a distal left main. It's a bifurcation lesion. I think it's a gray area. And the more complex the lesion, the less likely I am to intervene in a patient that's absolutely fixed on the cuffs, despite whatever physiology is performed. So just to not make too fine a point of it, we all drive a car. We all come to a stoplight. It's a red light. It's a green light. It's a yellow light. Yeah, I know what to do with red. I know what to do with green. When I get to a yellow light, I know what to do sometimes. And that depends on the traffic and it depends on the patient. So a borderline value is a yellow light. You have to revert to being a clinician. In my 85 year old little frail lady with a borderline value, I think I might take it easy. But in my 50 year old hard driving executive, I might step on the gas. So this is being, the tool gives us the option of moving one way or the other. It doesn't mandate a response. And I mean, it could be a couple of points above or below the thresholds that we use. So we shouldn't be so rigid to think that it will answer every single clinical scenario. I would like to work with a red light and a green light and skip the yellow light altogether, but I don't live in that world. All the time. So if, do you complement that with imaging or have you used imaging and say, you know what, let me IVIS to see what is this lesion is or the MLA. Would you practice that? I hear that sometimes from operators. No. But I don't know. I mean, either you're going to treat or not treat. And then once you decide you're going to treat, you can IVIS or OCT. But I don't let IVIS be my deciding uh, piece of information. I don't know. Dr. Fort? Well, uh, I do have one conflict of interest, it, it turns out, because I, I approached intervention from an IVIS perspective. Uh, I've been using it almost as long as you've been using it in physiology. So I've always been very pro IVIS, but the data is not there. Uh, the randomized control trials never really showed as much. We had music maybe with bare metal stents. Gary Mintz will show a meta-analysis of thousands of patients that finally shows us a small clinical difference <laughs> of using IVUS with drug looting stents. So really to get back to an individual patient, I think IVUS is very useful to, to interpret complications. It's very useful to show us how to stent complex lesions, but I never, uh, ever use IVUS for a diagnostic perspective, even in left main lesions. I think physiology has been with us for you know, almost three decades now, and the data is there to prove us that when we need help, that's the, the, the armamentarium we should uh, grasp, not IVUS. I'm bringing it up because of the combined trial that were presented at TCT that's showing the uh, TICFA, you do a borderline or normal FFR, and then you do OCT. And if you have a TICFA positive or thin fibro elasto, uh, elastic uh, cap, then you stent or you follow this patient. It did worse. But again, small study is a kind of just scratching the surface. Not there yet. One last question from the audience. Explain the importance of dichotomous and its position and decision uh, made in treatment. The the importance of a dichotomous threshold? Yeah, that's what uh, I'm getting that. I'm, I think, yeah, that's what he means. Okay, so when you do studies to, to make decisions, you have to pick some number to make a decision around. And in medicine, unfortunately, it's never perfect. You pick a number and 
The dichotomous threshold for FFR was raised from its initial 0.75 to 0.80 because there were studies that suggested uh, the values between those two were also positive or negative. So they picked the upper end of a gray zone and said for a clinical decision, we're gonna favor the benefit of the doubt to the patient. And so we picked 0.80. Uh, IFR did its dichotomous threshold against FFR and they picked 0.89 as having the highest AUC. And uh, then they did studies. But again, remember it's a spectrum of responses and there's all kinds of other factors involved. So we have to understand what a dichotomous threshold means. And it's mostly for study purposes rather than entirely clinical mandate of behavior. I bet Stephen would agree with me. All right, let's move on. I think we're still on track for the time. Uh, let me introduce our third speaker, uh, Dr. Olivier Bertrand. Uh, he is currently Associate Professor of Medicine at uh, uh, Lev uh, Laval University in Quebec and adjunct professor at the Department of Mechanical Engineering, McGill University of Montreal. After his medical training in Belgium, he uh, pursued a subspecialty training in interventional cardiology at the Montreal Heart Institute and obtained a PhD in experimental medicine at McGill University. He worked as a full-time interventional cardiologist at Quebec Heart and Lung Institute since 2000. He is scientific uh, director of the International Chair on Interventional Cardiology and Transradial Approach. His current research interests include transradial approach and optimal antithrombotic strategy, post-PCI physiology assessment, and multidisciplinary design optimization of new devices for interventional cardiology. Uh, Dr. Bertrand, you, the platform is yours. Thanks for sharing your slide and thanks for being with us. Go ahead. about you're muted olivier okay no no you should be able to hear me yes are you yes, yes. okay so uh, sorry sorry about that i had switched off my my mac so i didn't want to uh, to uh, make some noise before so it's my my pleasure from quebec city to talk about a new field of investigation for me which is uh, we do know now that physiology uh, prior intervention works what about post pci so these are a few key uh, key points that i will entertain and maybe raise your interest uh, since there are many things that are ongoing and I, there is no uh, definite answer. So why post-PCI physiology? Obviously, when we talk about uh, post-PCI and as uh, everybody has mentioned, everybody's looking for cutoff. Uh, we have to remember this is a spectrum, but we have to make clinical decision as it was said already by Morton many times. Uh, we have some data about FFR and uh, uh, resting gradient as well. And of course, the most important is that, is there a relationship between uh, post-PCI physiology and clinical outcomes? And I'm gonna show you a few examples from my practice. So first of all, I'm pretty sure, I don't know if uh, people from Absence uh, uh, know more data, but when you ask physician about the use of post-PCI uh, physiology, it's still quite rare. And of course, the advance of a fiber optic a guide wire or pressure wire like the uh, OptoWire 2 or 3, it's making our life much easier since uh, you have to understand that when you have light transmission, uh, it's, it's a binary signal. So either it's light and you have a 100% transmission or it's broken, for example, and if it's zero. So you cannot have any uh, modification of the signal from the PD of course, you have also to consider that you may have a change or a drift from the PA. So let me give you an example what, which raised my interest about post-PCI FFR some time ago. So this is a patient uh, that uh, was 82 uh, years of age and he presented with unstable angina and you have a very uh, uh, two, um, uh, one severe and one moderate lesion on DLAD. So I'm gonna show you on the lateral view and you see this is a very tight lesion and there is a second lesion, there is a moderate lesion on the diagonal which was negative. 
I'm just going to show you at the time that was the opto wire two or even one when we use uh, during the, the first in man. You see, I'm using a five French guiding catheter all the time. So you see that even with a weak support, I mean, you can cross the lesion, you can position nicely the opto wire. At the time, the lesion was obviously physiologically uh, positive with an FFR uh, 47, PDPA was also low. But the main thing is that I want to show you so the increase of value following dilatation. Of course, one of the main advantage of the opto wire is that you can use it as a regular wire. You see here, I'm, it's a calcified lesion. As I said, it's an old patient. So we uh, basically predilate using the 2-0 balloon. And then for the sake of the discussion, I repeat the uh, uh, physiology. And you can see that when you start to, to uh, dilate, as was shown by Grunsik many years ago, I mean, you get some improvement, but it's not obviously perfect. So next step, I went with 3-0 balloon. I repeat the physiology and it's much better across. I'm crossing, let's say the threshold of 80 with an 82. But of course, nowadays we put a stand. So I'm gonna show you when, when, we, when you advance the stand. So you, you see, this is obviously a classical DES. We deploy the stand. And I would just ask you to pay attention. I would say that basically my routine is to deploy all my stand at 22 atmosphere for one minute. That's my routine. So you see, this is the, re the result on the lateral view. And for those of you with gray hair, you know that there is a step up. It's basically, I would say, an angiographic perfect result. But when you measure, when you measure physiology, you got an FFR of 80, 84 and a PDPA close to the threshold value of 92. So why you don't get normal value, you, 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 may, you may ask. And one thing that you have to keep in mind, this is the LED and the myocardial mass is massive. So why should we pay attention to post-PCI FFR when the stent result angiographically looks perfect? I will just pay attention. I don't have much uh, slides uh, to uh, uh, bother you too much, but pay attention to this slide from Absorb 2 when we're comparing the BVS when a DS. And you see that even at six months or one year, we still have about 25% of patients which remain with angina. And we have also, uh, I'm gonna go quick, but if you look at the ex exercise objective signs of ischemia, you have about 20% in both groups of patients with positive exercise tests at distance from the intervention. And when you look at this slide from uh, define PCI, you see that overall in all our trials, when we look at the result after one year, for one patient with one or two lesion, even within randomized trials, we still have patients with a significant number of, of them uh, with residual angina. So maybe we are not that good when we use the angiogra angiography to assess all results. So we did a meta-analysis some years ago with one of my, my students, and we, we look over the last 25 years, and you see that the range of FFR after PCI has not improved or increased significantly over the years. The red dots are after balloon only. And overall, from that, from that meta-analysis, we got the magical numbers, let's say, that we should target the 0.90 that you see most of the time reference in the literature. And I would just mark the, the point that in about 80% of the case, you're gonna end up with a value between 85 and 95. Well, this is for a meta-analysis from the literature. So we didn't have individual patient data. Is that true for all cases and all lesions? Probably not. And I will show you in a minute. Do we have the same kind of data for a resting gradient? So far, we have only data with the IFR and defined PCI in more than 500 patients. And you see that you have an increase uh, immediately after PCI. And in this, in this case, you can see that the mean value went up from 69 to 89 in, in, uh, uh, immediately after PCI. What is interesting also is that you see that you have an increase going from 0.7 or even decrease, or you, have a, you may have a huge uh, increase in the resting gradient. What is important as a clinician is that, of course, you can perhaps think that you can use a physiology, the uh, FFR or the uh, resting gradient 
to guide your um, procedures, you may also use imaging like in this, uh, uh, at the bottom you see an experience from um, our cancer and you see that you get this value from 63 before, uh, immediately after you are still below the 80. And when you, got, you use OCT, IVUS imaging combined with physiology, you can have a significant improvement in the final FFR. Yet, I will just pay, uh, mark your point to say that even when everything is perfect and geographically and based on imaging, you have in this series about 20% of the cases where, where the patient have a FFR below 80. And it's practically exactly the same when you look at uh, in the uh, above uh, uh, graph from defined PCI, you can see that you have about 20% of patients with an IFR, which will remain between uh, below 90 at the end of the procedures. Why is this? Well, I mean, the, the common reason is probably that, uh, that, as you know, atherosclerosis is a diffuse process. So if it was just a focal lesion and you would get rid of the lesion by a stent, of course, you could anticipate that you would get a perfect physiology afterwards. But as we all know, I mean, that's not the case. And especially if you think also about the LAD, I mean, more or less you have a, a, some, some disease, but you have diffuse disease. So you're gonna end up with a spectrum. And unfortunately, with, in some cases, you, you will get below 80 after perfect angiographic result as stenting implantation. So of course, as a matter of cutoff, uh, we are left with observational data. And this is a, um, a study, a very large study that was performed in Asia, published uh, last year. And just to make a quick uh, suggestions in terms of cutoff value, you could see that using the LED, the cutoff value with the best sensitivity and, and specificity was quite low, 0.82. And with that cutoff value, you could see that in terms of target vessel failure, you have a significant difference. And of course, if you, if you look at the non-LED lesion, the cutoff is much closer to the so-called 0.90, which I showed you before. But still, you have a significant difference after follow-up in terms of target vessel failure. So that raised the possibility that we should use different cutoff uh, between vessels after PCI. Is it the same after IFR? This is the follow-up that was presented at TCT from defined PCI. Again, I remind you more than 500 patients. And you see that there seems to be a difference in terms of outcome using a cutoff value they're determined at 95. So let, let's go, let's finish my talk with a few cases I, I did in the lab. So this is a 70 year old uh, male patient who had a previous cat in a different city in Montreal about a year ago, we all, all, all only know that there was a moderate uh, RCA lesion and the IFR was one. There was no FFR done. The patient was discharged. He presented after two uh, boots of uh, unstable angina and he had some troponin bumps, but very marginal. So we did the angiogram and this time you see we have a very severe on the mid distal uh, RCA. It's a huge vessel. So by curiosity, I repeat the physiology. And as you see, it was very stunning to see that my PDPA and my DPR were still negative. So you will, you will I'm sure, admit that this is a very severe lesion. In fact, I have been asked many times why I did physiology. It's because I, I need to study post and I do pre, of course, in any, any case I can. And you see to my surprise when I did the FFR, so when I did induce full hyperemia, we usually use 300 micrograms of adenosine on the left and 150 on the right. And I have a very uh, severe gradient appearing with the FFR of 68. So this is a wonderful example. This is, I have to admit, one of the most beautiful I've ever seen, but this is significant uh, example. Sometimes you have to push and, and question even the resting gradient. So I did the FFR, then we obviously stand with the 3.5, which was expanded with a non-compliant 4.0 at 24 atmosphere for one minute. And after the whole three indices resting 
NFFR were 1.0. Sometimes I would just uh, make your attention that you can get, when you go very distal in the right, you can go slightly above 1.0. So that was example number one. The second example, it's not always that easy. So I had a patient who had a BMS uh, in uh, about eight years in the in the right uh, in the right vessel, and I show you that uh, he presented with unstable angina on exercise on exertion, and he had diffuse disease going from the mid to the distal part. The stand the BMS was here. So I repeat, I'm going to show you the angiogram before. And from the from the area of view, and then of course we did the physio pre. So in this case, again you see the PDPA was 0.92, DPR was 87, and FFR was clearly uh, positive too. So the DPR was concordant with the FFR, and so we did discuss with the patient because as you see here, obviously the decision is that if we embark on dilatation, we're going to need to fix the whole mid distal segment. So that's what we did with the intent to finish and just expand the stent uh, here. Unfortunately, things became much more complicated by using physiology. I'm, I'm, I'm just skipping many slides, but let's say that I was going for it 15 minutes pre-CI and this ended up with a much longer uh, PCI and much more complicated using physiology. So basically, after the, 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 the stent, which was deployed in the distal, the FFR was still below 80 and the DPR was borderline, 92. So I had decided at the time to further expand the, the BMS using drug eluting balloon and non-compliant balloon. Unfortunately, when I'm done here, as you see, I still have my FFR, which is below 80. The DPR is basically borderline, but I have a, I have a dissection. So I, I have no choice, but I finish and I put another stent proximally as well. And again, in this case, I repeat physiology and then I got what I would say a perfect physiology and angiographic result by having a PDPA of 98, DPR 96 and FFR of 92. So as you see, I mean, that was an extremely complex procedures. I started by putting a, a 2.5, 38 millimeter length uh, distally. Then I had to go back using a non-compliant uh, small diameter balloon, 1.5, 2, 3, drug routing balloon, another stand. It took me about two hours, but at the end of the day, you end up with a perfect uh, physiology result as well as um, phys uh, angiographic result. Of course, now we have to show that the trade-off to get optimization using physiology endpoint is worth the benefit. And this is my last example, because we don't know yet much about cutoff value. So this was a, a young patient, 55 years of age. He was a marathon runner. He presented with a positive stress test, no angina. And he was referred by his friend cardiologist for an angiogram. He had so, a disease on DLAD. So a colleague of mine put three stents on DLAD and two stents on the diagonal. Unfortunately, he showed up for his follow-up exercise test to the same friend cardiologist and his exercise test was still positive. Because he was willing to go back to marat marathon running, the guy said, I have no choice, I send you back for a, cat, a new cat. And I got the patient two months later. So I was interested in this case. So this was, and you're gonna see, this was the, re the final result after the stent implantation on the, on, the, um, on the LED and the diagonal. It's a, it's a dominant circ, but you see, I'm gonna go fast to finish in time, but you see that this is a perfect result. So when the patient presents, it's still perfect and geographically speaking. These are the two views I want to show you. But I was interested to see what about physiology when I have some time and it's still angiographically perfect. Because as you know, many things can happen between, uh, during physiology, you can embolize, you can underexpand many things. So in that case, I use this and I repeat the FFR on all the physiology and I got a very nice 89 in the distal LED, DPR, sorry, DPR was 0.91 
and PDP was also opposite, uh, was 94. And on the diagonal, same thing. I had an FFR 88, DPR 95, and PDP quite uh, high. So, you know, in this case, I explained to the patient that unfortunately, his exercise test will probably remain uh, electrically positive for the next 10 years, and he doesn't need a uh, further angiogram. So my conclusion at this time is optical fiber-based pressure wires such as the OptoWire 2 or OptoWire 3 offers now the possibility to combine the mechanical properties of a workhorse PCI wire with extremely stable pressure assessment prior and immediately after PCI. You don't need to reconnect because as I, as I said, if the wire is not broken, the, the, the fiber optic is intact and you get 100% transmission. The field of post-PCI physiology is only, in my mind, at the beginning stage. We don't know yet the trade-off between optimization. And if you remember, I mean, we used to say that if you, if you want to dilate, you're going to use IVUS. If you don't want to dilate, you use FFR. I think that it's not going to be the same thing when you use FFR of physiology after the initial stand implantation. You may end up by let's say edge dissection under expansion. So you may be using more IVUS, more OCT, and certainly more uh, physiology. Measuring PD, PAPD uh, either at rest or after hyperemia still in my mind requires peculiar attention to all the signals, especially also I've found recently that when we use the automated injector, you may end up with drift on the PA side and not on the PD side. But this, of course, will in, in influence the ratio. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bertrand. Phenomenal talk. I would open this to the panel if you have any question. Uh, I have a couple of questions from the audience or any comments. Yeah, so uh, Olivier, those cases are, of course, stunning uh, in their stimulation of our thinking that, that we may or may not know exactly what we're doing. So I just took a word on that last patient because that was terribly bothersome to me that a marathon runner, asymptomatic, would get stressed and then an angiogram and five stents with no other intervening thing. And then he ends up with you and now you have to check the physiology and, and decide what to do. So that's aside from using physiology, but I think your application of it was probably the single most helpful thing in this guy's existence. The The... The, the probably the most difficult area for people, one is to employ the tools at all to use physiology. And second is to use them, use the answer they get from the tool in the correct way. That is, it's not unusual for somebody to do an FFR or IFR and decide they don't like the result and they stent it anyway. Sure. And we, you know, if you're going to employ a tool, you need to use the answer. Otherwise, just stent it, save all the time and trouble. So, um, I think that that was good. the The controversy will continue for a while because we don't have. We'll have to continue with standards, and it's very hard to know what the true standard of myocardial ischemia is in some people. And uh, if you were to invent a new tool today, what would be our ischemic test? Right. So, PET scanning probably. Dr. Fort, you ever have a a case like Olivier's there? Yes, um, the more you use it, often the more times you're likely to see these disconcordant, confusing results. At the end of the day, I'm not quite sure if I make the right decision, but some decision has to be made. Going back to basics, trying to take in as many aspects as possible from the clinical, from you know, common sense, from the angiograms, maybe imaging with either throw CT. Uh, it's going to throw us up. Uh, we're going to going to find some problems that we can't currently solve. But I think it's taken us in a huge step in the right direction. Has it solved 100% of cases? No, but it's certainly the way we need to practice currently. Yeah, I, I like the concept of a straightforward approach whenever you can take it. And you've simplified the practice well by accepting one watch. And I, I, I admire you for that. Yeah. Um, I'm in the, the academic side of the world. And so I got to address the people who don't believe in one watch. They believe in four watches. And I, yeah. I don't know. So, so, Chadi. so I have a question for you from the audience. What are the circumstances when QFR 
cannot be substituted for FFR or IFR. So oh. FUFR has sensitivity and specificity of more than 90%. Do we really need FFR or IFR? Okay, so, so it's a little early to go to accept QFR as our standard yet, but in the future, should a study of substantial quality and size produce a QFR value of 90% plus uh, corresponding to FFR, IFR wire base, then it could possibly replace it. However, remember angiograms have their limitations, even 3D reconstructions. And so we're gonna have an, right now 80 to 85% concordance. And you have to again decide how close to a standard, which they used FFR, how close to that standard do you wanna be? I think, I think the angiographic based FFR stuff will come to us in five years, maybe sooner, maybe later, but I think it's, it's got the same concept. It's surprising to me that we have not adopted more CT FFR in clinical practice. Uh, and I can imagine why, I mean, if I don't own the scanner, but I own a nuclear stress test, I know which one I'm gonna use even though it may be inferior. Um, that's very cynical with regard to the, my colleagues. So I apologize to you if you're in that category, but facts are facts. So um, let me ask, Olivier, are you a CT FFR guy? No, we don't, we don't have CTA uh, FFR. Uh, the point I will make, uh, Morton, uh, with all those, uh, I've been working a lot with engineers and, and of course my, my job and usually my way of practicing is usually to try to skip the complex uh, equations that we have zero interest and just keep perhaps the philosophy uh, of it to try to apply it as, as a clinician. And as you know, any of those uh, techniques, first of all, if it takes, let's say five or 10 minutes, it's way too much for me already because I'm also academic, but I've, I'm busy. Uh, and then they have to make assumptions. So if, if the way you want is just to have a number and trust any numbers, especially if it goes in the direction you want, basically put a stand, you're gonna like it. But I think that if you pay five minutes attention to what they have to put into equation to convince you, uh, measuring is like believing. I mean, that's when you just uh, make assumptions and the, the flow, uh, there are many things that I think that will work as a research tool. Clinically speaking, I'm not so sure yet. Well, that's why we have multi-center trials and outcomes. Otherwise, we would all get lost in the detail. Sounds great. Uh, uh, yeah. Dr. Fort, do you want to get ready with your slides? Uh, sure, Shelley. Yeah. I think we're still on good on time. Uh, we have maybe 10 minutes to go over slides. And they have one more question from our audience. We'll entertain it at the end. OK, thanks, Jelly. So this is the final um, presentation tonight. Um, uh, thank you for everyone for attending. I hope you found it beneficial. I'm just going to share with you uh, one case uh, of attempted single wire use of a pressure guide wire, the opto three wire. Now I have to be very grateful for the first two slides. Um, these uh, images uh, were sent to me by Olivier Bertrand. They're currently from a publication in press from him and his colleagues in CCI looking at development of fiber optic uh, pressure wires, in particular the opto three wire and interesting, very interesting results based on bench testing against established guide wires. As we can see from this image, the evolution of the opto wire has resulted in a, a shorter tip, a smaller, more robust sensor, and a stiffer shaft that's currently available. So when you compare this in bench testing against what for many people is a workhorse wire such as the BMW wire. You can see that the BMW wire on this graph is in yellow and very, very close performance by the Opto 3 wire, which is in orange and obviously far superior to the Opto 2 wire and other pressure wires that are currently available on the market. Again, this goes back to the construction of a, a single larger nitinol core with the fiber optic sensor. Now, in terms of torqueability, once again, the results are very similar to the previous one. 
The BMW wire again is in yellow with the triangles and the Opto 3 wire, the current version available from Opsense with the large national core it is in the orange line with the orange circles, very similar performance in terms of talkability an essential component for interventionists. Now this is the one hour drift and perhaps towards the end, we, uh, the end we can ask Olivier about his, you know, what's, what drift is. Certainly in terms of the piezoelectric wires, I've not had a one hour drift, I've had a two minute drift and it's, it's a big issue. Uh, I certainly have far less confidence with the piezoelectric wires than I do with the fiber optic wires. So I'm going to illustrate a case. Uh, it's quite a complex case, maybe not as complex as some of the ones that Olivier showed. This is uh, a patient who, who was turned down for multivessel bypass surgery. You can read the, the risk factors there. He's known to have coronary disease. Uh, there was clinical and angiographic deterioration over the last few years. Uh, he presents with symptoms, his non-invasive test, uh, the Pesantin cardiolite, which was uh, four years ago, was only borderline, now comes up with a significant anterior reversibility. And because of his comorbidities and is described as frail by our cardiac surgeons, he's referred back for multivessel PCI. So this is his uh, left ventricular function. Um, you can see a small area of hypokinesia inferiorly related to the uh, chronically excluded right and a much larger area of anterior uh, hypokinesia. This is right coronary, hasn't changed for many years. It's occluded in both the mid and the distal portion. And, oops, my apologies. And the left coronary, I apologize for those of you that uh, don't like, uh, don't use swing angiography, but I'll just go through it slowly. So this is a uh, EBU uh, guide catheter. You can see there's a moderate osteal stenosis of the left main. You can see a tight proximal stenosis of the LAD plus huge collaterals via the AV circumflex to the occluded right. There's Timmy two flow down the LAD and also quite diffuse disease of the mid and distal uh, LAD as well as the diagonal branch. So this is a radial approach. It's an EBU six French guy. Sorry, Olivier, I'm still stuck in the six French world. Um, and using an Opsense three wire to try and do everything with it. So advancing the Opsense wire after uh, equalization across the lesion, measuring the DPR, which you get within seconds, and it's positive at 0 0.85. So we're gonna stent this lesion. I had to pre-dilate. Uh, I stented it with a, as a stent below that high pressure, not as high as you, Olivier, but my routine pressure. Angiographically, it's good. Um, fortunately, uh, physiology shows that now in this circumflex, I've got a good result. So going on to the next lesion, this is the LAD. So probably didn't need to physiologically assess the proximal LAD lesion. The, the wire crossed it very easily. And the DPR in this case is strongly positive at 0 0.36. This occasion was able to direct stent on the Opsense 3 wire and then optimized it at higher pressure with an NC balloon. And that's the angiographic appearances. I was quite pleased with that. And it's good to see Olivier doesn't quite get completely normal results in his LADs because I was a little bit disappointed at 0 0.92, but didn't feel that I could further expand that proximal LAD stent any further. It goes all the way back to the ostium. It looks well expanded, but as Olivier has already shown you in one of his cases, a slightly lower DPR than we would otherwise expect. I hadn't finished with this wire. I'm gonna try and cross the diffuse disease in the LAD. Now, all wires have limitations. And in this particular case, uh, the Opto 3 wire, despite its probably market leading talkability, pushability and stiffness would not cross this lesion. 
I therefore wasn't surprised where it took me uh, quite a while to cross this lesion and it required a fielder XT wire. So just to show you how complex this lesion is, is that despite the use of two balloons and high pressure, both those balloons burst. So this gentleman's going to come back for rotoblator debulking of the LED and diagonal at a later date. But we haven't finished with this wire. We're going to need to look at the left main osteal lesion. So the fielder XT wire is still in place. We're advancing this wire down the circumflex. And perhaps no surprise that the DPR of the left main is 0 0.99. Nine. And this is the post PCI result. We've got Timmy 3 flow down the LED, but it's going to come back for more work in the mid LED and diagonal at a later date. So, uh, in summary, uh, this is the last presentation it's two vessel PCI using the uh, Opto 3 wire. Uh, we delivered two stents. We performed five DPR measurements, three easy reconnections. You can see the timelines there. Uh, this wire was useful over, a, a, over an hour during practice. I didn't show you, but I can promise you that there was zero drift at all stages with this wire. It did manage to cross three of the four lesions, not all of them, but three of the four lesions. And I say this patient's coming back uh, for a stage procedure. So uh, it's a very useful piece of equipment, obviously more expensive than a standard guide wire, but you can get your money's worth out of this wire. It is nearly functioning as a proper guide wire with the added advantage of multiple uh, physiological assessments of the vessels that you're intervening in. So that's the end of my presentation. I'll return it to you, Jerry. Thank you so much, Dr. Fort. Phenomenal cases, challenging cases as well. Uh, I have just one comment about the left main physiology versus imaging. Which one do you trust more? When, which one do you do versus the other? Well, as perhaps I uh, indicated in the past, um, I used to be a big IVUS guy, but the cutoffs are really consensus. The data support 0, 6, uh, 6.5 or in an Asian population swallow on are extremely weak. They're scatter. If you base your revascularization, be it stenting or bypass surgery on that, then you're going to perform bypass surgery in patients that physiologically don't need it. The grafts are going to close down and you're not going to perform revascularization on patients that do deal, it, deal with it. I see there was one a question on the chat about performing multivessel physiology in patients yeah. pre-bypass. We do get asked by our surgeons usually perform IVUS on the lesions that they're concerned about. And the answer is we usually do physiology rather than IVUS. So it isn't perfect as we've illustrated on a number of occasions tonight. But I think the strength of data uh, is definitely in physiology. It's not as strong in the left main, perhaps uh, as it is in the more distal vessels. But really, I, uh, at the moment, I don't think there's anything else that can compete with it. And I'm quite happy to perform physiology on left main lesions uh, rather than I this. Nice. Um, one other comment is about why you picked left circumflex for the pressure to drop the up three wire and the circumflex instead of the LAD. I know the LAD has a fielder XT there. Um, why did you opt it for left circumflex? I mean, why did I intervene on the left circumflex and the LAD? No, why did you put your pressure wire to do physiology on the left main by oh, putting the pressure wire in the left circumflex? Um, yes. I, it's just the way it went. I don't <laughs> think if to assess an osteal left main lesion, I don't think it's that important which Doesn't particular matter. vessel it went down. Okay, so I think you addressed that. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Bernard. Stephen, I was ju I was just uh, uh, asking you, uh, would you use, are, are you using the assist or any automated injection system or you use the old way? The old no, way. We, we use the automatic in inject system, yes. I haven't found it technically a problem. As long as you're absolutely certain about the flush uh, and the weight. Because hmm. we, we have to, I mean, maybe Morton can command, but I, I have learned a lot when we start the, the the initial first in man with the with the the opto wire, we we learn after five cases that the, you don't get drift from the PD because as I said, it's a fiber optic. 
But then after the trial was finished, we moved to assist and I enjoy it. It's so nice. But then you have to pay attention that when you flush, the membrane can just change four or five millimeter. The, uh, if you don't flush, you, you may have full of contrast. And also the level when you measure, I mean, if you change during the procedures, basically you may have many factors that can influence a few millimeter mercury change from the PA. So even if your very nice case, you had zero drift, sometimes you don't get it because I mean, you after two minutes, you're gonna have like, if you measure like multiple lesion and you, you take the habit to measure the drift, mm -hmm. you're gonna have a two or three change. You don't, you don't get it or you don't understand why. I will just say, pay attention to the automated system. I don't know, Martin, if you want to come in to come in on this, but this is something I've learned. Yeah, no, we have to we have to read zero frequently during a hemodynamic case. So I know that the and we're not using a pressure wire; we're just using fluid transducers. And so we see drift. I, I presume it's drift. We see a change. We re zero. We get start over. We get new measurements. Now for clinical hemodynamics, AS or mitral, it, the, a couple of millimeters probably doesn't make any difference at all. But for translesional coronary measurements, a couple of millimeters does make a difference. So I, we, we don't pay too much attention to re-zeroing the assist machine in the middle of, a, you know, the, middle of the procedure, but I think we should. I, I have less or very small concern that the uh, optical fibers drift. We've seen connections, reconnections. I don't have any, I don't really check that very often. Occasionally I'll see a big difference and I presume it's due to the wire, but it's probably more due to the fluid. And I think that study needs to be presented and people need to pay attention to that. Cause I think the standard should be zeroing to the pressure wire, not to the fluid and as an accurate measure, but we've, We've got it backwards. Um, what I what I think one of the take home messages is is that with a high quality wire, we can assess and you can treat and you can check at the end, shortening the time and shortening the expense and doing with confidence. I think that's a change in our practice. I think that we don't look at post PCI FFR nearly enough. I know I don't myself because. I mean, although I work on the optic wire often, I just don't don't check everything. If I have the wire in, I check. But I may be using a different system. I have five different pressure systems in our lab, and so we we rotate and do different things to look at different uh, comparisons. So I think that's important. I think Stephen's case and your complicated cases, uh, I think this was very helpful. As as much as imaging is required, physiology is required. And, uh, and uh, one case, one lesson for me from Dr. Ford's case is, uh, and Dr. Bertnard is, this wire is even for complex lesion, it's like almost 99 small channel this wire was able to cross. But also for the distal, mid to distal LAD where you, the, the wire would start to buckle is the only wire was able to get through was a CTO wire, which is, that tells you don't bother with another workhorse wire, just go and upgrade your wire to a, to a CTO wire. Thank and you. Right. This, uh, can we do a rapid fire questions across yeah. the panel? We have a few minutes left. Uh, what is the right place um, to uh, do equalization? If it's okay, uh, is it okay if we have to place a wire across the lesion for equalization? Dr. Bertnard? Uh, well, I mean, I, I would say that maybe Morton should, should answer this kind of... Yeah. Uh, so uh, equal, I'll give you the short answer. Equalization should occur anywhere outside the coronary ostium. It can be in the guide or out of the guide, but it shouldn't be across a coronary lesion and right. certainly not, not anything where flow would be interfering. It has to match guide pressure. So equalize it in the guide or you can stick it out of the guide if you want, it doesn't make any difference. But once you put it in, it should have already been equalized. You can't change that. You have to I think we answered this question, but I will send it again. Tips and tricks when using FFR to assist left main lesions. Uh, FFR meaning hyperemia. So you you equalize, you seat, you advance the wire, and you unseat, and then you can use IV adenosine, or if you're very clever, you can inject a bolus, a substantial bolus of adenosine, and then unseat your guide. What uh, is your dose of adenosine? My dose is is for the left 150 to 200. Uh, I don't think higher than that makes any difference. Uh, for the right 50 to 100. 
I worry about heart block on that first injection. So I don't like to see too much heart block. Dr. Fort, any comment on that? Uh, you're asking someone who has only used adenosine <laughs> once in four years. No, I think um, I think the, the resting diastolic gradients are really good at RCA and left main osteal lesions. Um, obviously, it, you don't have to um, mess around with the guide. You don't have to worry you that where the intercoronary adenosine went. Um, you don't have to mess around with intravenous infusion with the extra expense. I think it's one of the strengths of the resting diastolic indices, uh, osteo lesion. So, yeah. I think Dr. Kern, I asked you this in one of the conferences, uh, but do you think there is a difference between RCA physiology compared to the other coronaries? Yes, but it depends on what it is you want to know. Once you, so the difference is the phasic pattern of flow can be systolic predominant or equiphasic in the right coronary artery compared to diastolic predominant in the left. However, once you cross the PDA, it becomes left coronary physiology. So this might only affect the RFR in a minority, a very small minority of cases where your systolic flow is a little bit higher than diastolic flow. I, and I haven't quite identified who those patients may be, but I don't think it's enough for us to worry about changing anything we do to assess a lesion in a right coronary artery. Roberto, do you have a comment? Yeah, well, I would just make a very uh, practical and technical comment con regarding equalization. Of course, I mean, the, the, the principle to equalize is that you want the, the PA and the PD to be uh, identical before crossing the lesion you want to interrogate, right? Right. The, my point is to is is regarding post PCI and coming back to what Stephen shown that you can you can disconnect the opto wire, you can work with the balloon the stand, and then you can just reconnect and remeasuring it. But if you check the PA and you re zero your PA, of course in that case you have to re equalize the opto wire. I mean, you don't need to re-equalize if you don't change anything, but if you re-zero your PA, of course, you, that in that case, you have to uh, go back and re-equalize the, the whole system before crossing the, the stand and the assess the final results. Other question, does Guideliner change your physiology measurement? Yes or no? If you have, a, if you have material in the Guideliner that creates a pressure, okay. Mm -hmm. I think in general, no, uh, as long as your transmission of pressure is good, uh, excellent. Otherwise, if you have uh, a damping, it will change it. A question to Dr. Bertnard case, uh, pull back. You showed us cases and uh, after stenting, the second physiology was still significant or meaning need to be fixed. Was this a focal or was this a diffuse uh, significant? Uh, it's it's a very good point. You know that probably we will learn more using the pullback, but I, I'm also very uh, practicing. And the point, my point is to be very practical. You know, when I'm very distal, and and I don't like the FFR or the DPR, I don't I don't spend time doing pullback. I only do pullback if I'm like basically I think it's perfect, and I don't understand. Then I'm trying to see if it's diffuse or if there is a step up at the at the stand level. But I'm trying again to, uh, to remain with simple equation. I'll tell you, I've become a, a recent fan of the IFR co-registered pullback. I have to confess. I didn't think I'd like it, but I like it. It tells me a lot. And it answers the question that was just asked. Keeping it simple has got some benefits. You could check your DPR over several places without doing a formal pullback. Uh, so the resting ratio can be checked and you get almost the equivalent of a pullback. You'll see where you're number changes because flow is constant and you're, you're moving it back. But I like that co-registered pressure. Dr. Fort, any comment on that part? Diffuse versus focal? Yes, uh, well, we just had uh, Sync Vision installed. We've been using the Volcano Verata wire a lot. We don't in Canada have the Omni wire yet. And that, that'll certainly be an improvement. Um, I've probably used it recently about at least half a dozen cases and actually it leads to a question I want to have with Livy because the I got drift in most of the wires that I used uh, 
and it was immediately apparent within a few minutes. Now, if drift is due to air bubbles, it's related to temperature. I just wondered why you chose the one hour mark to measure drift to differentiate those four wires rather than something more uh, rapidly, because in practice, uh, it seems to be within the first five minutes if I'm going to get drift. But no, the sync vision is a huge advantage. Um, but it goes back to the microcatheter. You know, you do lose wire position. You do have to be pretty confident that you can recross if you do have a lesion. So I do do pullback, but I think like Olivier, I usually do a pullback when I think I've got the best angiographic results I can currently get. And I think so, you have to keep in mind that the pullback, in my view, from what I've learned from post-PCI, will be required from DLAD. Again, I mean, you get, most of the time when you do a stand in the, in the circle on the right, you get close to 90, 90 quite easily. The problem is DLAD. You get, you get stuck in the 82, 84, and then you start to question if it's perfect or if it's because of diffuse or you miss a lesion. And in that case, pullback will be probably very useful in DLAD. DLAD is a different animal, and we all know that the question sometimes is, should we go for a mammary artery or a stand? So that's why also the most complex, I would say, uh, question that you get the stent and then you, you get stuck with the physiology that you don't anticipate. Well, I'd like to thank you all for your time and for staying late for the people on the east side.